Thanks for being with us tonight. I'm George Knapp. Uh, We're talking tonight about the great food conspiracy. Uh, Mike Adams, my first guest, turned his life around, changed his whole way of thinking about food after being diagnosed at age 30 with type 2 diabetes, likely the result of poor diet, not enough exercise, stress, depression, chronic pain. He changed his whole outlook on life, founded naturalnews.com and the Consumer Wellness Center, to help teach people how to live longer, healthier lives, and to combat some of the BS put out by the food conglomerates and Big Pharma. Mike, great to have you on the program. Hello. Thank you, George. Thank you for having me on. It's a great honor to be your guest tonight. Thank you. I'm amazed. uh, You know, I'm not a health nut by any means. Uh, One look at me, you can figure that out. But I'm amazed how often people send me articles uh, from your site uh, because they know I have an interest in, in these kinds of issues. Um, but uh, it's great stuff, great material on there. Well, thank you. That, that, that's great to hear. We certainly work very hard at uh, putting information out there and trying to counter a lot of the propaganda put out there by the food companies and even our own FDA, uh, I think, misinforms people about food. Maybe we'll get into some of that tonight. No question about it. I'd like to start with an overview, sort of an overall assessment from you, your take on what Americans are eating and what the consequences of those choices are. Wow. Well, a lot of it is food <laughs> fiction. I mean, it, it is so much of it really isn't food. And I, I think that the main function of food today or the main effect is to actually promote nutritional deficiencies and cause degenerative disease. Now, that may not be intentional. Perhaps it is in some cases, but by and large, it's probably not. But that's the effect. Nevertheless, we have skyrocketing rates of diabetes doubled in the last 30 years uh, across North America. Cancer rates are still sky high, not getting any better. Uh, We have very high rates of Alzheimer's and and dementia and depression. Many of these are food-related, and if you look at what's in the food in terms of chemicals and then also what they take out of the food, stuff that should be in there, the nutrients and the medicines that are naturally found in foods, then it starts to make sense why these foods are so toxic to the human race. And how much of this is a result of food getting just so big, so profitable? We're not anti-capitalist on this program by any means, but um, I guess there there has to be some sort of a ha- happy balance. How much of the problems, how many of the problems that you're describing are, are a result of the business model? Well, that's a really interesting point, George, because most people, I think, would, would say or would agree that local food is honest food. So if you go to a farmer's market and you... You buy food from a local farmer, you know, a few vegetables or, or some milk from a local farmer or some local grass-fed beef or something like that. that that's, that's usually fairly honest food. But when you start getting into these big food conglomerates and it becomes a for-profit system that, where the food travels a 1,000 miles before it gets to someone's plate and it goes through all these distributors and wholesalers and then it goes through all these factories and then it's marketed and publicized and labeled and, and modified. I mean, by the time that gets to you, it, it's, it's not really the stuff that you thought you were buying. And it, for example, I can give you a, a great example here just with sugar. With white sugar, did you know that, you know, raw cane juice is really rich in, and I'm talking about sugar cane, of course, it's rich in minerals, it's rich in phytonutrients, but they take it out when they process it into white sugar. And the byproduct of white sugar, that is all the minerals and vitamins that are missing from the sugar, is black molasses. So molasses is where all the minerals go, and and a lot of that goes into animal feed to keep the animals alive because no, no one makes money when your animals die on the ranch, you see. But they feed the deficient white sugar to human beings while the farm animals get the nutrition that's missing from the sugar. That's just one example, but it goes on like that across the industry. You know, some stuff, uh, some of what you describe is good. Most people would say it's great to be going into the supermarket and it's December and you can buy fresh bananas and grapes and tomatoes that had to be shipped from somewhere else. It's great that American consumers have that kind of choice. Yeah, that's a really good point. We do live in a time when we have access to more nutrients and more superfoods and and a greater diversity of, of many types of fruits and vegetables than at any other time in human history, if we access that. But statistics show that right now 80% of the diets of North Americans is made up of only 20 or 22 different foods. That's it. They eat the same stuff. 
genetically modified corn, uh, processed wheat, pasteurized, homogenized cow's milk, uh, refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup. It's a very short list, and the list isn't really that good for you. So we're not taking advantage of, of all that great capacity that we do have, you know, in our modern age. Uh, it's a great point, though, George. I mean, we some people do take advantage of it, and they're getting superfoods from all over the world, and, and they're really in great health today. We have a, an area here outside of Las Vegas called the Moapa Valley where they grow all kinds of tomatoes. I, I happen to just love tomatoes. I grow them at home here uh, because you can't get a good tomato anymore, and that's what really bugs me is that, uh, about tomatoes. They, uh, one thing is they grow them in Moapa, and instead of sending them here to Las Vegas, they ship them all over the country. Uh, instead of them coming here right down the road, they spend a lot more money, waste a lot more fuel sending them elsewhere. In addition, because they need to transport them for five or six days, they've grown these uh, Franken tomatoes that are a tough skin, that, don't, that are they have to design them so they can be easily picked by mechanical means. They don't taste the same. They don't feel the same. They're not the same. Right. Franken tomatoes. I saw an article just the other day about a super anti-cancer tomato, and I, I read the article, and it turned out that these were just tomatoes grown in soils that were rich in selenium, and, and selenium is a well-known anti-cancer mineral, and it's lacking in most of the soils where agriculture is conducted today. So this one company figured out, hey, we'll add some selenium to the soil, we'll grow these tomatoes, and they have a very strong anti-cancer effect which is true, by the way. It's, it's well, well documented. But it got me thinking, how did our soils get so poor that just having a regular nutritious tomato is now called a super tomato? I mean, what, what is everybody else getting? The depleted tomatoes? Because that's what they are buying in our stores, and I think that's some of what you were describing there. They're not real tomatoes like we expect to pick off the vine and eat that evening on our own dinner table. There's something strange going on with the food. And I, but, I hope we get into more of it. But, but why does that business model make sense? Okay, grow tomatoes here outside of Las Vegas and then ship them everywhere but Las Vegas. Well, it, it, it all comes down to economies of scale. You know, one, one farmer using a GPS-driven tractor and using a, a genetically modified organism and then spraying these herbicides on them, herbicides that are specifically designed to be resisted by these genetically modified crops, they can produce huge quantities of crops that, that look like real food, even though inside they're lacking the minerals that we're supposed to have in our bodies. And this is why so many Americans are deficient in crucial minerals today, not just selenium, like I mentioned, but also uh, magnesium, for example, and even calcium and chromium and trace minerals are lacking throughout the diet because these big agricultural companies, they figured out how to grow large quantities of nice-looking foods that just don't have anything on the inside. And they figured out how to make money doing it, even though they have to ship it a long distance. But, you know, as petroleum prices go up, as the oil supply begins to dwindle on our planet long-term, let's say, if, if you follow that theory, then we're going to see food forced to become more local because that's the only thing that's going to be affordable. You know, you, you can't transport it across the country if, if gas is $10 a gallon. Let's take a, an example. Uh, I saw this documentary, and, and I know you've, you're familiar with it as well. I mentioned it a couple of months ago on the program, Food, Inc., a tremendous program. And one of the things it focuses on is corn. I thought maybe you could talk about that and help us understand, use that example of that particular crop, that commodity, uh, to, to uh, use as an example of all the various things that are wrong with big agribiz and what it is doing to us, to food, to animals, to the environment. Oh, it, it is incredible. That's a great example, George. In, in fact, if we get into the corn ethanol issue, oh, that's yeah. where the insanity really starts to come out. Because, as, as you probably well know and your listeners do too, it takes more than one gallon of gas in terms of fuel equivalency to grow enough corn to generate a gallon of ethanol fuel. So you're actually putting more fuel into the corn than you're getting out of it for ethanol, Meanwhile, you're reducing the food supply, which is causing the rising of corn prices globally, which is resulting in food shortages in developing nations where starvation is now rampant. I mean, this is all a side effect of something that was well-intentioned but not well thought out. So that's the ethanol side of it, and, and thankfully people are coming to their senses on that. But let's get to high-fructose corn syrup. I mean, here's something 
here's a sweetener, a liquid sugar that many experts believe, nutritionists believe that, that it's linked to an increased risk of diabetes and, and obesity. Yet the, the corn industry says, no, this is a completely natural substance. We just extract it from corn. Well, that's true. That's true. But you also you extract cocaine from coca leaves. That doesn't make cocaine safe and healthy, even though coca leaf tea is perfectly safe if you drink that in, in Peru or Bolivia or South America. You know, you, you, you extract other hard drugs from other plants like poppy. It doesn't make the hard drugs safe. So high fructose corn syrup is a concentrated, artificially extracted liquid from a crop that is otherwise very healthy for you when it's wholesome and, and not genetically modified. And it's in everything. Everything. It's in almost everything, yeah. Even salad dressings, even pizza sauce. You will find it in the most amazing things. If you read labels, you'll find it in areas that you just could not ever imagine that, 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 that it should be in. And a lot of people don't know it's actually extracted using a toxic chemical catalyst called glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is... It, it, it's often also contaminated with mercury in the extraction process. This is something that we've documented very well, and even the corn industry uh, has to admit it. They've admitted it, that it's true. Uh, there is mercury contamination in some high fructose corn syrup, not all, but some, and they are working on improving their methods so that there's less contamination, but this is something that has been going on throughout the history of high fructose corn syrup. I guess if you're listening to the program in Iowa tonight, you're happy that uh, that America is growing so much corn. But I, I guess there has to be a saturation point. It almost looks like we're growing so much, uh, a corporate decision made by someone somewhere, that they've got to find new uses for it and are just slipping it into everything we eat. <laughs> yeah, probably. We'll be sleeping on corn mattresses before very long if they keep it up. Now they, there's, It's almost impossible to avoid corn. And... It's actually almost impossible to avoid genetically modified corn. I think a lot of your listeners are aware of the GMO issue, but, you know, a lot of corn products that say natural, well, that doesn't mean that they're not GMO. So, for example, you can find at grocery stores corn chips, and they'll say all natural corn chips with natural flavoring. Well, it doesn't mean that they're not GMO. In fact, most of those are genetically modified corn chips. You have to go to organic and USDA certified organic in order to avoid genetically modified corn. And that's, that's something that's really important for, for everybody to do is read the labels and make sure you're going for USDA organic. That, that's one case where a government agency label actually means something legitimate. It's really true. I remember uh, some years ago, uh, Taco Bell which had these, makes these corn tortilla shells. It used to be yellow corn tortilla shells. Suddenly they went to these flimsy white uh, tortilla shells and when you ask them, what the heck's the reason for this? Oh, there's a corn shortage. A corn shortage? A corn <laughs> shortage in America? There's a corn shortage? I, I, so I don't know what the real reason was, but I just know that uh, anybody who who frequents Taco Bell is probably was disappointed when that switch was made. <laughs> yeah, that, that's hard to imagine, a corn shortage in America. But it is interesting that a lot of the, the radical weatherization of our planet that, that we've seen, you know, with the, the hurricanes and the tsunamis and tornadoes and floods and droughts and fires and freezes, food is becoming more difficult to, to produce. Again, we don't have a shortage of corn, as, as you mentioned, but we are seeing problems with citrus crops and we're seeing, we're seeing problems uh, with even infectious disease among crops. There's a, a, a disease called UG99, wheat stem rust, that is making its way across Asia right now, and if it reaches the United States, and some, some agriculture experts are afraid it will, then it could really devastate the, the